Oh, Kayla's here. Okay, we are at around 200 people watching. We should get going. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome and good afternoon to the second webinar in the OPTIC 2022 series of three webinars. Today, we're joined by Colby Brown, Sony Artisan. And you know, Colby is a, is a veteran of past optics. He's an amazing wildlife photographer. He has many clients. And when we were chatting just before about the lead up to this, it was pretty impressive because he was saying where he's going to be going next. We don't want to talk about what happened in the past. Let's talk about where we're going. And uh, he's got an amazing assortment of places and animals. He'll be photographing from silverbacks to jaguars to the Amazon. Pretty incredible. Before we get begin with the program, I just want to make sure that everyone who is watching this has actually registered for Optic. By registering for Optic at bhoptic.com, you'll be able to get newsletters and important information about the event coming up. So for those of you that are watching virtually and won't be able to attend in person, just to let you know, we're going to have three stages for you. The main stage, second stage, and also a vendor trade show room Zoom happening. So you'll have plenty to do when you're watching virtually. The fun all starts June 12th. Now, for those that are attending in person, wow, are you going to be amazed because on Wednesday, June 14th, the last day of Optic, Sony is taking us on a whale watching and beach party experience. It's going to be amazing. We're going to jet out on a sea street boat out to the ocean, the tip of of uh, the tip of Sandy Hook. We're going to do some whale watching. We're going to have equipment on board. It's going to be a blast. The ship is really cool and super fast. And then we're going to go to a beach party in the Atlantic Highlands in the sandbox. We're going to have an open bar. And not, for those of you that are planning on attending virtually, you may want to check some tickets and get here to New York right away. So that's going to happen on Wednesday. That's the last activation of Optic and it's four days. Uh, but uh, for right now, we've got Colby Brown on. And uh, Colby, want to bring you live into the TV here and uh, welcome you. Thanks, David. Happy to be here. Thank you for having me. This is fun. I always love coming in and hanging out with you guys for Optic. We've had some good Optics in the past. You know, this is the eighth iteration of Optic since 2015 is the eighth one because we snuck in an extra one. We were supposed to go to San Francisco, but then something called COVID happened and we had to cancel it. So we turned it virtual. <laughs> Fair enough. No, this is great. You get more people involved. This is this is great. I love it. Decentralizing education. That's the point, right? Exactly. I mean, right now we've got, uh, yeah, we've got uh, almost 300 people watching. So uh, for those of you that are watching, I want to let you know that uh, we love your questions and uh, just post your questions in the YouTube chat box. And then if uh, we'll be able to bring those over to Colby, uh, I'll be interrupting Colby a little bit during the presentation if the question is very pressing. Otherwise, this is going to go for about an hour and we'll take about 10 15 minutes to do a q a so without further ado let's turn this over to colby take it away Thanks. thank you david excellent well thank you guys for watching uh, i'm excited to be here as you guys can hopefully tell um, i love talking about photography in general but certainly wildlife photography which is something that i'm incredibly passionate about and i've been doing for probably about the last six seven years in my career which has spanned the last 18 years uh, and as David was mentioned, I, I get, I'm pretty fortunate to get to travel all over the world to do this, um, which is why I was excited to put together this presentation uh, as a lead up to this year's optic. So I got a lot of stuff to cover. As David said, we have a lot of opportunities for questions. I do have a lot of things to cover, so we will try to interject those, but please send your questions in. We'll try to do some of those live um, during the presentation, but we'll also try to do some of them at the end. And I'll try to speed through things as best I can uh, so you guys get the most uh, most amount of information that you can out of this. So let me go ahead and share my screen here and I'll do the PowerPoint presentation and talk over it. 
um, and we'll go from there. So let's go ahead and share our screen. Go ahead and share this. Make sure my class is ready. There we go. All right, David, can you just confirm that uh, you're good to go? On you're, you're, you're good. That was a pretty smooth transition. And uh, I love that. I love your screen in the background as the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Keep, Thanks. Keep it, going. keep it meta, right? All right. All right. Let's go ahead and jump right in. As I said, we got a lot to cover. So for me, as I mentioned, I've been, I've been a photographer, a professional photographer, for those that don't know me, for roughly the last 18 years. And throughout the course of my career, I have kind of dabbled in a lot of different genres. A lot of this is to just how my personality works and how my brain functions where I need to have new challenges. Otherwise, I get bored. Even if I'm photographing things I'm passionate about, I need to kind of mix things up. And what started off as an interest or a love um, in travel photography and travel experiences that led into landscape, which led into humanitarian photography, which led into night and astro, and ultimately has led to my you know latest passion project, as I mentioned, which is wildlife. So let's talk a little bit about that, about wildlife. What's interesting about wildlife photography for me is that if you asked me eight years ago if I would be interested in photographing wildlife, I'd be like, what are you talking about? Like, I want to go travel to remote parts of the world. I want to go photograph, you know, rare cultures and have these new experiences. But wildlife photography just wasn't in my vocabulary. It wasn't something that I was truly interested in. I really appreciate watching the National Geographics and BBC Worlds with Planet Earth and things like that. But I didn't want to be the guy at the time that would sit in a bird blind for a month to photograph a bird of paradise in Papua New Guinea. That just wasn't my, it wasn't in my wheelhouse. But what happened is that as I continued to travel throughout my career, I found myself in locations where I might have had a focus that was on something different. But tangentially, I had these opportunities to photograph wildlife. I think that's how a lot of people get into wildlife photography is that it happens based on opportunity or sometimes by accident. It's like, hey, I'm going to go to Alaska because I want to go see the glaciers. And then all of a sudden you're there. You're like, hey, I didn't realize there were so many bald eagles here. Maybe I should try to take some photos of that. Um, and so that's kind of how I also got into photography it was just based on that idea of opportunity. And then what's happened and what's been interesting for me as I, as I mentioned, I, I need to keep changing kind of my interest in photography, my genres, is that wildlife photography has presented whole new challenges that I really haven't experienced in other genres that I have been trying to professionally um, uh, you know, capture over the last 18 years. Unlike studio work where you're working with models that you can work with uh, your subject matters in order to, to give you know, great compositions and great looks and emotion and uh, you know, you have controlled settings of, of, you know, light and atmosphere inside that studio with artificial lighting, or even if you're going out into the, you know, into the wild and photographing, you know, the night sky or even a landscape and a sunrise, it's a lot different than landscape photography. I could find myself in a location photographing a sunrise and all I need to worry about is the weather and I can see the mountain and then I could figure out something, you know, hopefully magical to capture. With wildlife, you're working with subjects that obviously don't speak your language, that don't listen to you, that are doing their own things. And you have to have the knowledge and the skills and, and oftentimes, sometimes the gear to be able to capture some of these moments. And then at the same time, you got to have patience. You got to, you know, know exactly what you're doing. You got to do your research in order to get to the right locations at the right time. We're going to talk all about this, but it's that idea of challenge that really kind of pulled me into wildlife photography. And then over the course of my interest in the last seven, eight years, I've really found myself traveling to all four corners of the globe, all seven different continents to find very unique species to photograph, to sit there and work with certain kinds of snakes or frogs or birds uh, or predators. I was in, uh, I was telling David that I was in India for a month photographing tigers in December. Um, you know, the, the different types of information, different types of places that it's, that I, and experiences that I've had over the last seven years has been magical. Um, trying to chase down and photograph and learn and, and respect the amazing wildlife that we have around the world. And so it's those three things, things that really kind of pulled me in that I think pulls a lot of people in, which is one, as we talked about, opportunity, photographing wildlife, because it's something that's also there and something uh, in contrast to something that we're there to photograph, to love the fact that it is challenging and then also that it can 
uh, if you have the the ability, it can take you to some pretty amazing places, both internationally as well as domestically um, within our own cities and our environments around our own neighborhoods uh, or our states uh, or certainly around here in the U.S. and Canada. So let's talk a little bit about what is going to be covered throughout this course, this class. So first, we're going to talk about logistics and planning. I know that's not the most um, you know, interesting thing to talk about, but it's something that's vitally important when it comes to wildlife photography. Then we're gonna talk about the gear that I use, um, talk about the different cameras and lenses and the setups that I have. From there, we're gonna talk about choosing the right shutter speed, which I think is something that a lot of photographers or wildlife photographers tend to struggle with, people that are getting into it. We'll talk about dealing with noise, shooting in high ISOs, which is something that you predominantly have to do in wildlife photography, again, more so than most other genres because you need to shoot at high enough shutter speeds in order to capture your subjects, especially those that are in motion. And then from there, we also have, um, you know, backgrounds. This is the idea of composition and how that matters so much when it comes to creating really impactful images. And oftentimes you don't have that luxury, but if you do, um, we'll talk about some kind of tips and techniques around that. And then we'll kind of wrap up with kind of your, you know, my hot list of my seven, you know, best tips and tricks for wildlife photography that hopefully you guys can use with your, your own gear and through your own adventures. So as I mentioned, first and foremost, research and planning is priceless. It's again, not the most interesting thing to talk about, but it's something that's vitally important to know exactly where you wanna go, what you were trying to, uh, to photograph, to learn about you know, habits, to learn about the environment, weather systems, time of year, all this stuff plays a big role. And I wanted to use a recent, uh, last couple of years, I've been traveling down to Costa Rica quite often to teach wildlife photography workshops and do a handful of other things. And so Costa Rica became a really good example because I had all this information kind of prepared for this presentation to talk about it. So Costa Rica is a very unique place. It's a place that is full of really great biodiversity. It's really accessible in terms of not that far of a distance for us here in North America to be able to get down there. And you have a lot of really great opportunities, a really great um, educational documentary series, such as David Attenborough's Life in Color that's on Netflix, that really dives in and spends a lot of time focused on the amazing, colorful, and vibrant wildlife that is down there. And I, I found myself watching these documentaries, including this one, and being like, you know what, I want to get down there. It's been a few years, and I want to capture some similar types of experiences. That's something that's that, that really kind of pulled me in. Sometimes it's that bit of inspiration that causes me to think more proactively about finding myself wanting to go to a specific location or sometimes to photograph a very specific species. And so, I, like I said, I wanted to head down there. I wanted to take my own images like this one of a red-eyed green tree frog. It's the probably most popular, uh, most famous frog in all of Costa Rica. Um, it is, it, they're abundant. It's not a rare species by any means, but it's probably the one that you guys have seen the most if you have thought about Costa Rica. Um, but I saw plenty of them on that uh, Netflix series as well as other documentaries. And it's like, you know what? I wanna capture my own. And so that's what I did. And so first off, you know, starting doing our research to figuring out how to get there, you know, pulling the pieces together, what airports can you fly into? Of course, in San Jose, uh, for Costa Rica, you have San Jose, which is the main international airport. There's a handful of airports around Costa Rica. Sometimes I also fly into Liberia if I'm going kind of on the, the Western edge, which we'll talk about in a second, but figuring out obviously exactly which airport you're flying into and how does that base change the trajectory of where you what places you want to include depending on the species you want to photograph is again quite important it's not some some countries like costa rica have multiple airports and so you can make your life a lot easier to fly into the right one that's much closer to the places you want to visit when to go this is again very basic in uh you know again stuff many of you guys probably already understand but for the most part it's really good to understand you know, temperature for the average temperatures for the areas you want to go in, uh, the times, that, the seasons that you're in, average rainfall. These are all, you know, I spend weeks, sometimes months planning for different trips to understand exactly where do I want to go? What am I there to photograph and how can I put these pieces together? So doing this, this research online with the internet and Google being highly advantageous for us, it's really great to kind of pull this, these pieces together and say, hey, May might be best for this type of photography, but September is going to be best for this or January is going to be best for this. And sometimes you don't have the opportunities to obviously travel anytime. So it's also good to know what is the best opportunities you might have for that month or that couple of weeks that you might have off uh, given for a specific type of trip that you want to go to any different region around the world. 
And a lot of places like Costa Rica have tons of blog posts out there letting people know the best times to visit at certain places times a year. What are the high seasons in terms of different costs? How much rain can you possibly expect? How many other tourists are going to be around there? A lot of people these days are now traveling with the idea that they don't want to travel during the high seasons, maybe because of COVID or things like that, uh, or maybe they just want to save money. And so understanding those different aspects, again, plays a big role in kind of the logistical planning. And then where to go? You know, Costa Rica is a small country, but it's also still quite large and takes a while to get around. So there are eight different regions around Costa Rica, and each of these different regions will have a cross-pollination of different species, again, depending on the types of things you're wanting to photograph. But again, knowing that if I want to go down to the central Pacific region to go to the Osa Peninsula is going to be different than if I'm planning, obviously, a trip out to the Caribbean, uh, the Caribbean region, because they have different types of frog species and they have different types of macaws, um, where you get the red ones down in central Pacific region, whereas you get more of the green and the blue up there in the Caribbean. So again, all these types of bits of information are things that sometimes people over, you know, don't think about, but it's, again, drastically important. And then lastly, what wildlife experiences do you hope to photograph? This is really important. Uh, this is kind of comes down a bit more to the research on the specific species you are hoping to capture again. Um, this is a, a Quetzal, which is arguably one of the most beautiful birds in the world, uh, known to lots of areas within Central, uh, uh, Central America and bits of the Southern part of the US even. And depending on the time of year I go to Costa Rica, I'm gonna have different experiences. If I go in May, April, May, I can actually capture uh, nesting quetzals, a male and a female with babies if I wanna capture them feeding outside of a nest. However, if I go in January, I'm gonna capture them during kind of the mating and the courtship you know, sessions. So depending on that, again, the type of experience I'm wanting to have, I need to plan accordingly. And then when you get species that are much more endemic to specific, spe uh, specific areas, that again plays a role. This is a, a, a rare uh, poison dart frog found in the, near the Osa Peninsula down there in Costa Rica. And knowing if, if I wanted to photograph this particular frog, I, know, I need to know which region to go to. I'd also need to know what time of year is best. Typically, it's going to be rainy season. It's always better for for frogs. Let's say I, I wasn't interested in frogs, but I wanted to photograph snakes. So snakes are going to find themselves much more predominant or more prevalent in locations when there's more frogs because that's what they like to eat. So if there's going to be a lot of frogs, I also know that that's also generally going to be a good season for snakes. So all this types of information, again, is really important to kind of pull these pieces together to make sure that you're planning at a higher level of proficiency to make sure that you have a higher you know, chance or a bigger opportunity to come away with the images you're hoping to capture if you do the extra legwork beforehand um, when it comes to planning and putting these pieces together. So what's in my gear bag? I'll try to speed through this and get, get to more of the tips and tricks, but it's something I think is worth talking about. So right now, my main camera is the Sony A1. I have two of these. I take them pretty much everywhere around the world. 50 megapixel uh, camera. It is uh, pretty phenomenal to have such high megapixel uh, high, a high megapixel sensor that can also take 30 frames per second and still shoot at close to 15 stops at dynamic range, at least near ISO 100. And to be able to have those three together is really kind of a world's first or arguably uh, it, it puts it up there in the top tier of photographic opportunities in terms of camera capability. And so it's something that I love, as I mentioned, taking pretty much everywhere. This is a Canadian lynx that I actually photographed up in uh, Alaska but it can photograph everything from pretty much everything. I mean, that's kind of where I think of it. It's, 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 you know, sometimes people describe cameras as a jack of all trades, a master of none. To me, the A1 is like the jack of all trades, the master of all. It's like great for video. It's great for photographing birds in flight or for scenes like this, where you have an animal that's moving a bit slower. It's great for macro work. Uh, it has great dynamic range and does ISO uh, really well. It is, um, it is my favorite camera that I've owned to date. Um, I am a Sony artisan, as those that are watching. So again, all of this is going to be Sony related. Uh, but yeah, A1 is, is definitely my favorite. I've also used the A92 for long periods of time. Uh, it's 24 megapixels instead of 50, so half the resolution. But you still get 20 frames per second. It's a bit more affordable in terms of the price range. And it is capable of capturing, again, pretty much anything you can need of, from landscapes to astro. Uh, and certainly when it comes to wildlife, you know, anything that's moving. Uh, is going to be able to be captured just as easily as anything that is um, kind of static. 
uh, a bird on a perch compared to a bird in flight, for example. Um, but I, I absolutely love the A92. I have literally taken it again to all corner, four corners of the globe, and it has been something that I, I love to use. A7R4, uh, this is, was my past um, high resolution camera that I used before I got two A1s and sold off my A7R4s. But again, it has, you have about 10 megapixels, 10 to 11 more megapixels than the A1. Um, it shoots at 10 frames per second, so it's a, not as great for things like birds in flight, which we'll talk about soon, but it has great dynamic range. It has a solid autofocus system. Uh, it is, again, an, uh, another camera that I used before I had the A1 that I'd use in tandem with something like the A92 if I wanted to capture a scene um, like this with a leopard where I wanted to maximize that detail because I wanted to blow it up for a print or to license it to, uh, to a company. Um, so the A7R4 is great. I actually didn't include the a 7 IV in the series only because I don't have one, uh, but I have used it. And it again is another affordable full frame option with great autofocus um, shooting at 30 uh, megapixels. So uh, you have that benefit of slightly higher than the A92. Um, and yeah, it, it, can, it can take a lot of these similar images. The difference between the different bodies here is that, you know, if you get the top end models, just like with a lot of camera manufacturers, it makes getting the images you're trying to create much easier. It's not that some of these models can't take a lot of the similar images, but like with the A1, because of its technological prowess, I don't have to worry so much about the camera not achieving exactly what I want to. And that's kind of my mindset. I want to spend less time working, worrying about the technical side of things, and more side trying to capture the best images possible. So quickly moving forward with the, the lenses themselves, this is the Sony 100 to 400. This has been a, a staple of mine that I've had since it's uh, launched. It is a great, great all around lens. It's a bit more portable than the 200 to 600, which we're gonna talk about in a second, in terms of packability and its general weight. Um, but it is a great lens. It's very sharp. It's part of the G Master series. So you know it has the best optics and resolution uh, uh, possible. Um, but yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of the lens. Uh, you can see reviews on BNH's website to see other people love it as well. Hey, hey Colby, I'll, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll I'll double that on that lens and the next one you're going to show are, yeah. are game changers. They're amazing. But I got a question from, uh, this is from uh, Jamie. And have you ever had issues with lens damage in the heat? I haven't had issues with lens damage in the heat. I mean, one of the interesting things about, um, well, heat has two different challenges, right? One is how it heats up and damages things internally. And two is how um, heat can optically cause issues when you're trying to photograph things, especially that are far away and using a telephoto lens. So you get optical um, distortion that happens from heat waves coming off of the earth or can technically also come off water depending on how hot it is, uh, which is why it's hard to shoot with long telephoto lenses during the middle of the day in hot environments is because you can feel like your camera isn't working or a lens isn't taking sharp images, but in reality, it's actually the heat uh, causing these uh, optical issues. That being said, with Sony's cameras or Sony's lenses all being white lenses, there's a reason that they're white. It's because it reflects heat off better or reflects the sunlight compared to black lenses, uh, such as you get with, with Nikon and some third-party options. Those lenses being black can actually absorb a lot more heat. And while I've ne never necessarily, or I've never personally damaged uh, a camera when I have used those other bodies in the past before it became a Sony ambassador. I have definitely known that those bodies and those lenses get a lot hotter than my Sony's do um, because of the different color ranges. So long-winded answer to your question, um, but I think both are, are definitely viable uh, talking points. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's keep going on gear so we can get down to the good stuff. Uh, so Sony 200 to 600, again, this is a really popular, affordable, uh, super telephoto lens. Uh, it's a little bit not as portable because uh, it's a long lens. So packability can be a little bit of a challenge and it's a little, it's a bit heavier than the 100 to 400. But what's great about it is that the zoom ring on this is about two inches uh, in total diameter. So if you go from 200 to 600, you can go extremely quickly, which is the difference between a lot of other zoom telephoto lenses where it can take a long time to go between the two. So it's really great to use in scenes where your subjects or you're photographing multiple things and you might have something that's close by and then something you see, you know, flying in, you know, down a river or whatnot, you can quickly go to from 200 to 600 very easily. And the results are really just fantastic. It can be a very incredibly sharp lens to use. It's something I usually recommend um, using the 200 to 600 because of its variable aperture of 5.6 to 6.3 to use when you have quality light. 
This might not be the best lens uh, when you're shooting in incredibly low light situations, but it is a phenomenal lens that is very sharp. Um, and when used with the right camera gear and with the right person that knows what they're doing, you can get some phenomenal results. And then of course you have the two big boys. You have the Sony 400 F 2.8 G Master, which is probably my favorite lens that I own. Uh, 2.8, you can see here the background blur and the bokeh is just phenomenal. Um, it's a very expensive lens. Uh, it's not super portable, but when you when you have it, you you know why you have it. Um, it is it is yeah, it is amazing. Most of the time, I actually use my 400 for more larger mammals because the 600 I'll show you guys in a second is a bit too zoomed in, but they can certainly be reverse. Sometimes I take my 400 to Iceland or places like Iceland because puffins are moving so fast when they're flying that I want to shoot at f2.8 and I really want that extra background blur for the separation between my subject. Compared to the 600 f4, which is going to be a bit, lar uh, a bit longer, um, I use that in scenes this is in India photographing tigers uh, where I couldn't get closer and I wanted to really fill the frame of what I'm doing. So I'm usually either using it for birds or birds in flight or things when they're far away or in scenes like this with a predator where I can't get as close as I might want to, to still fill a frame or fill the frame and not have to crop so many megapixels. Uh, both of them are, are phenomenal, phenomenal lenses that even if you, you know, you can't afford to purchase because they are very expensive, you can rent them for specific trips. And sometimes that can work out as well. And then you have the teleconverters. Again, these are really great things to have. They're super small and they help to make your smaller telephoto lenses zoom in a bit more. Uh, the 1.4 will give you a sacrifice of one stop of your f-stop and then the two times teleconverter has a two-stop sacrifice. So you, um, you have to just take that into account with the type of light you're shooting in. But if you really wanna fill a frame and still shoot at with full frame to get a subject like this bald eagle in Alaska and sacrifice no megapixels, uh, sometimes throwing on a teleconverter can absolutely make it worthwhile. And then recently I found myself using my macro lens so much more. Um, I love using macro lenses in places like Costa Rica or Panama or the Amazon to photograph reptiles and amphibians using um, uh, external light sources, which I'll talk about in a second. But a, a macro lens is a phenomenal tool to any wildlife photographer's kit. And it's something that you can take advantage in your own backyard. I live out here in Eastern PA. And it is great to be able to take my macro out and photograph frogs or toads or insects. Uh, there's a whole new world that it opens up. And it's something that I've really enjoyed doing for the last few years. For me, I, the, typically for my third-party lenses that I'm using off-camera flash um, is I'm using a Godox, uh, a Godox uh, V863. I usually have two of these. I'm using in tandem with a naturalist or a guide in the location to help kind of hold the lights as I'm positioning myself to photograph a lot of these snakes and reptiles and smaller, uh, smaller creatures. And sometimes I'll use something like an Aperture MC RGB LED light that gives some kind of color contrast within a scene if I want to get a little bit more creative. And then you can use something like the LumaQuest Strobus kit. Uh, I believe b &H has all of these for sale, but this is the kit that I use, uh, uh, or one of the kits that I use to be able to have a soft box on the light to really give that soft light effect, which is something you really want to be able to, to have to create an image like this where you're photographing in the middle of a jungle and you need the light to get enough, you need more light in order to capture things in focus. And also with macro images, you're really shooting at higher apertures anyway, to kind of deal with your depth of field issues. And so if you're shooting at F18 or F22, you need a good quality um, off-camera flash light and you want to have a good soft box to kind of balance that light off. Otherwise it looks a bit too harsh. So being able to photograph snakes or frogs, or snakes in creative ways using light is really great because it helps overpower the kind of natural light that you have. So you can really kind of isolate out, but we're gonna talk a bit about that in a second. And so that's kind of just the breakdown of the gear. I know that was uh, you know, a good 10, 15 minutes, but again, it's important with wildlife photography because unlike other genres, the gear you have is gonna make the difference between if you can capture certain kinds of creatures or photograph certain kinds of creatures or not because just the distance factor that happens with most of these types of species. So choosing the right shutter speed. So this is again, something, this is a question I get most often when it comes to wildlife photography, or one of the most often, is how do I know what shutter speed do I need to use? And I'll talk a bit about near the end when I give my seven tips and tricks that talks about my favorite things for birds and flight and stuff like that. But I think it's just important to understand that when it comes to your exposure, your ISO, your shutter speed and your aperture, you really want to have your predominant or the pillar example of that exposure triangle 
is going to be shutter speed. You want to make sure your ISO is as low as you possibly can, can, can use. And sometimes that's going to be higher. That's actually the next section talking about high ISOs. But you want a low ISO or low-ish. And then your shutter speed becomes the priority. So if you're photographing, say, a bald eagle, like this juvenile bald eagle, you're going to have to understand kind of the speed of the bald eagle, not exactly how many miles per hour it shoots, but just know that is it a slow moving bird? Is it a fast moving bird? Is it small? Is it big? Like these factors play a role where I know that bald eagles have large wingspans. They're not like hummingbirds. They don't flap very fast. So you don't need to shoot at say one five thousandths of a second in order to capture a bald eagle in flight. You can get away with one fifteen hundredth, sometimes one one thousandths, depending on again, how fast they are. If you're capturing them right when they take off or right when they're landing, or maybe when they're dive bombing, all thing, all those different factors have a slightly different shutter speed need. And so if you're not sure, you can always use a higher shutter speed, but then you're going to have to deal with noise, which again, we'll talk about in just a few slides. And it's not just for birds. A lot of people think birds in flight is kind of the main thing. And there's certainly a aspect of that in terms of understanding that birds in flight do move very fast, especially the small ones. But you can be photographing mammals like uh, Alaskan coastal brown bears. This is a, a young uh, little spring cub here that I, I took near Brooks Falls a few years back. And being able to photograph this guy at water level, choosing the right shutter speed uh, of around one 800th of a second, where you can still get details in the claws and you get the kind of the water freezing and pulling those pieces together is the right shutter speed for the time of scene, scene I'm trying to capture. Sometimes you can get creative with a really low shutter speed and get the movement of a subject, but those are much more difficult to pull off. And something that I recommend you try once you kind of nail down this idea of how fast is my subject moving and what shutter speed do I need to use? And then what's interesting when it coming back to macro photography, which I'll do throughout this trip, uh, this talk is when you use flash and you use, you know, off camera flash or any flash, really, you have the added benefit of the fact that you are increasing, you, you are using flash in a way that gives you the opportunity to use a much lower shutter speed than you normally would in order to freeze a moment, uh, freeze a subject in motion because of how the flash is working in the, in the light is capturing the frozen moment as the flash hits the subject. You have the ability to, to like I said, to, to use a much lower shutter speed. This image of a vine snake that was being quite aggressive and, and trying to snap at my, uh, my camera, um, I was able to photograph this at one two hundredth of a second. I'm able to do similar types of things uh, using flash with say hummingbirds, which I don't unfortunately have an image here to show you, but with a hummingbird using a flash and a little bit more of a, uh, a proper setup to be able to capture a hummingbird with its wings perfectly detailed with, you know, one two hundredth, one two fiftieth of a second, depending on the high speed uh, sync settings within uh, the different both camera you're using and the flashes. So understand that if you use flash for certain subjects that allow for it, you can get away with using a much lower shutter speed in certain situations. So how do you deal with noise? This, this is probably the most asked question that I get. So talking about hummingbirds, this is a hummingbird taken in Costa Rica. And a lot of people, again, don't fully realize that when it comes to wildlife photography, you do have to use a fast enough shutter speed to count, counter for not only the movement of your subject, but also for kind of the lens you're using. And what I mean by that is if you're shooting at a wide angle, you know, 16 to 35 compared to a 400 or a 600, you have a much more leeway to use a slower shutter speed with those wider angle um, or, or much less of a zoom. So when you're zooming in, this is image was taken with a 600 millimeter, I have to use a fast enough shutter speed, not only for the hummingbird, but also for camera shake or for movements in my lenses, because the more I zoom in or the more my lens zooms in, the more my camera or my images become susceptible to things like camera shape or optical distortion, like we talked about with heat waves. And so in order to overcome that, you have to use a higher shutter speed. Now this image looks clean, right? But this image was taken in the middle of the day with a pretty high ISO. I believe it was around 1,000, uh, 1,200, something around there. And what's interesting is that the original, if you actually look at it, so this is a program that I use called Topaz Denoise that helps me clean up those image files. Now, even with the best sensor in the world right now, even if you're shooting at a high ISO, you're still gonna have some noise, sometimes even during the day, not just in the twilights, the dawn or the dust size. So using a program like Topaz to be able to help you 
remove noise and allow you to pick the shutter speed that you want to get uh, is really kind of a game changer when it comes to wildlife photography and something that, again, a lot of other genres of photography don't typically have to deal with. And so there's Topaz Denoise, you have uh, DxO has their own uh, Pure Raw, uh, you have On One, uh, On One Photo Raw also has their, their own um, noise reduction um, third-party options. And then, of course, Lightroom and Photoshop also can help with this. I can teach an entire class just on you know, dealing with noise with wildlife photography. But I just wanted to give you guys a quick insight that most of us do that do this professionally are okay with shooting with higher ISOs and dealing with noise after the fact because technology has made it much easier. And there are so many times, as I mentioned, where you're shooting a scene and you just really need to be able to capture a subject with that high ISO and it's in the early morning light and you're just going to have a very noisy image otherwise. And then using something like Topaz the noise to clean up that image is really going to make a huge difference in the quality of that shot. Now, this is an image I like to use um, in this demonstration, not because it's necessarily the best image. Um, if you look into the details, things do get a little bit smushy. But what's interesting is that this image was photographed with an A9 Mark II at dusk. So the sun had already set. It was, it was virtually, I wouldn't say pitch dark, but it was pretty close. I photographed it with A92 with my 400 F2.8 from a boat of this Jaguar in Brazil. And what's interesting about this is that I shot this at about 10,000 ISO and then used the Topaz denoise in order to clean up the image. And so it might not be something that I might end up being able to sell or license to a company or put on Times Square, but it is a very recoverable image that I can do something with when I use some of these third-party programs. So understanding that you, it is okay to photograph at high ISOs when you need to, to get the right shutter speed is again, a pillar um, a topic to, to understand when it comes to wildlife photography. So backgrounds matter with wildlife. This is again, something that's important that you usually don't have to deal with, with landscape or a lot of different travel situations. But when it comes to compositions, finding ways in order to isolate your subjects is something that I'm always, that I always have on my brain. How do I photograph a subject and try not to get the chaos? Like when you're photographing landscapes, again, you're using wide angle lenses and you're trying to get these big grand landscapes and there's beauty in that. But when it comes to wildlife, oftentimes you don't want the chaos. You want to find these intimate moments and oftentimes finding the right perspective between, you know, standing up, uh, you know, laying on the ground, um, trying to find a, a, a higher perspective and changing your angles can make the difference between a photograph like this with a puffin, with beautiful krill and just an amazing shot to me. And then another image that's going to have a bunch of distracting birds in the background. So this was actually photographed using the 200 to 600 and the A1 this past summer. And I would intentionally position myself lower than the puffin that was perched on the sea cliff because I know there was a blue sky behind it. And I really wanted to pull out some of a little bit of that color detail and isolate it from the rest of the challenging, you know, the nature of what was happening out there. You know, same thing can be said when I photograph, this is a Cayman back in Brazil. This is an image that I took with a 100 to 400 and the A7R Mark IV. And what I actually did is that I saw this small little puddle with the Cayman, this was a kind of a sub-adult Cayman, so a couple years old. And it, was, it wasn't right near the water's edge. It was kind of more in the middle of this, this little um, puddle. But what I did is I got out of the boat and I put the lens right on the water. I had my hand at the very bottom of the, the lens holding it. So my hand was getting wet, but the camera itself wasn't. Then I used the articulating screen to kind of angle up. The reason that I did this is because it gave me the best angle to not only get this reflection, but also to remove all those other distracting elements, even using the 100 to 400 with its 4.5 to 5.6 barrier aperture to be able to come away with this nice clean background where you still get some definition and texture but it really was a much better shot than if i shot you know standing up looking down on it or if i was even on my knee level i needed to get to water level to really pull this off and the same thing can be said for a lot of birds sometimes again you don't have this luxury but when you do shooting with as low of an aperture as possible uh, this picture of a hummingbird in costa rica was photographed at f 2.8 to again, allow me to make all the jungle in the background that had a little bit of light on it really pop and, and kind of smooth itself out to isolate this, uh, the hummingbird. I didn't have to do any extra um, post-processing work to that background because um, it was positioned in the right spot. I positioned myself waiting for a hummingbird to perch right on this because there was a feeder nearby and it just kind of all the pieces came together. 
So trying to remove those distracting, you know, trying to not have to deal with those distracting backgrounds in post-processing uh, is a really lifesaver when it comes to saving time with processing wildlife images. And again, talking about macro images really quickly, as I mentioned before, briefly using a flash and being able to overpower the natural light. This was taken, this picture of a, a glass frog in Costa Rica was taken during the day, but because I'm using flash and exposing for that flash, I have the ability to essentially control the light in a situation where it looks like it's in the middle of the dark or even in a studio. But this was in the jungle using a flash to isolate this glass frog um, and come away with, again, a very, uh, a very simple composition that to me is much more powerful than having a distracting background uh, kind of pull the viewer's eyes away. So seven tips for wildlife photographers. Let's go ahead and keep going and we'll have our Q and A's. Uh, we'll have plenty of time, hopefully for Q and A's. So first one is to customize your gear. This is something that I can't stress enough. Now, again, as a Sony ambassador, I'm talking about Sony gear. A lot of other manufacturers do like some customization. I think Sony is probably the most customizable. Uh, I might be biased, but regardless, it's a invaluable tip that I can recommend to you. So this image that I created was specifically meant to show you what can be customized on your Sony camera. So this is the A1 and the arrows you see here are all the different buttons that you can customize to your liking. And this doesn't also account for the FN menu as well as your My menu. So for me, any feature that I want to on any camera that I've ever, ever used, especially the Sony's for the last eight years, I make sure to take the time to look over the, the, the manual, to use it out in the field and to figure out what exactly, what settings do I need to have one button click away? And those are the ones that I will apply to, you know, the C button, C one, two, three, or four, or the rear dial. And then anything I'm okay to have two button clicks away, I dial it into that FN menu. See that image on the left says FN, you press that, and then you get 12 more options. And the beautiful thing about Sony is that you have 12 options that can differentiate between still image and video. So if you shoot both, you can have that FN menu be customized when you're in still mode to have 12 different options to when you're in video mode, it can have 12 other different options that don't relate to, to, to photo. So either way, customizing your camera to make sure that you can dial in and have all the settings, all the features, all the technical abilities of your camera right there next to your fingers at any time you need it is something that I'm always thinking about. I wanna be looking through my viewfinder and have my fingers know exactly where they need to go. I don't wanna be looking through the menu and, and, and stumbling around, try to adjust something and all of a sudden the bird flew away that I was missing. So taking the time to dial in your cameras is huge. It's super important, it will save you some time. And that way you can get out and you can focus on the thing that we're all here to do, which is actually you know, photograph, you know, photography and capturing amazing images. So the more frames, the better. This is probably most important in wildlife. Also, I'd say sports. Um, but when it comes to shooting at high frames per second, some people don't necessarily think that shooting at 30 frames per second, for example, on the A1, makes that big of difference. But the difference between shooting at 30 frames per second and say 10 frames per second with some of the competition or even some of the different bodies within the Sony lineup can make a difference between that perfect articulation of this red macaw's wings as it's flying out there. And I can tell you that if you're shooting, if, if you're going for a scene with fast moving subjects, having, you know, essentially three times the amount of frames per second that you can possibly capture in a, in a given, you know, second, then I think it can make a big difference in terms of uh, making sure you're getting everything dialed in right. Sometimes when I photograph either macaws, bald eagles, herons, sometimes like you'll get the perfect wingspan, but the eye is, you know, it's closing its eyelid to protect its eye, which a lot of birds have as protective covers. And so having that extra second that you have just, you know, a fraction of a second later where the wings are still beautifully articulated, but then you also have the eyes open, again, you're gonna have higher chance to coming away with keepers and the images you wanna get with shooting with high frame per second camera bodies. Hey, uh, Colby, uh, yeah. we have a, a ton of questions that we're gonna to have to get to, sure. but uh, one real relevant right around here. Um, can you talk about focus for a second or using single point focus? This is from, uh, uh, this is from Dave. How yeah. You yeah, well, uh, Dave, if you if you could actually hold that, I have a, I'll have a slide that I talk about my favorite yeah. settings for birds in flight, and we can elaborate a little bit more on that. So um, let's 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 come back to that um, in just like two or three minutes. 
Does that work? Sure, sure thing. No problem. All good. Perfect. Okay. Um, okay. So the next one, talking a little bit about autofocus. So uh, Animal IIF is a game changer. IIF is I autofocus. And what this means is that when I set my camera to look at a subject and on the A1, I can choose between human, bird, and animal. If I choose the right one, which essentially narrows down the AI, the uh, processing power within the camera to say, hey, if I'm looking for animals, look for these types of shapes for the heads. If I'm looking for birds, look for these. If I'm humans, looking for those to be able to figure out where the eye is. And then what's gonna happen is that I, I photograph most of the time in continuous autofocus modes. Uh, and I'll talk about the different area modes in a second uh, for Dave's question. But the camera is gonna automatically find where the eye is, such as with this young, uh, uh, young silverback gorilla. And then it's gonna track it the entire time. So if I'm in autofocus um, AFC, continuous autofocus mode, I'm literally gonna hold that button down. And what's gonna happen is that a green square is gonna pop up around the silverback's eyes. And as the silverback swings around the branch or moves, it's gonna to try to track it even without me doing anything. And that just makes the idea of having tack sharp eyes with almost every single one of my wildlife images to be that much easier to capture. It's obviously possible to capture great images of wildlife, you know, wildlife scenes like this without that, but with it, it just makes my life so much simpler as a photographer. And the same thing can be said for lots of different species. Again, whether it's photographing, you know, a guy that looks like uh, Mufasa, uh, you know, a big male lion in South Africa, to a baby leopard climbing a tree, to uh, you know, a a cormorant that is attempting to <laughs> to eat a catfish that is much larger than the actual fish itself, uh, or much larger than it can actually swallow. I, I watched that bird try to eat that fish for about thirty minutes, and it never succeeded. Um, but regardless, the entire time, my, my cameras, A92, uh, the A1s, um, uh, the A74s, any of the ones uh, that have the eye out of focus really can make a difference in making sure that you're not going to get the back of, you know, the beak sharp and the eye not sharp. With a leopard, you're not going to get its tail sharp and not the, the, the eye sharp as it climbs the tree. Uh, for Mufasa here on the left, you're going to make sure that those, the, the, the retina, the eyes are going to be perfectly sharp every single time. Uh, and that to me makes, again, a big difference. So making sure you understand IAF and how it works within your camera settings and with the type of species you're trying to capture is really big. Um, being patient, anticipating the moment. This is really big in all wildlife photography. This is that idea that you want to, to prepare yourself to have the right camera settings as best you can predict and to have the right you know, lens uh, and camera set up and then position yourself in a place where you have the higher probability to capture the images that you can try to get. This image of a cheetah uh, taken in Namibia was just one of those moments where it was using a 100 to 400, so the cheetah was quite close. This is with the A92, I believe. Maybe it's the original A9. And being able to sit there and, and me and this particular female made eye contact uh, a couple minutes before, so I knew that she at least knew where I was and I literally just sat there and waited for the moment for her to turn her head. I had about three quarters of a second where she looked me dead in the eyes. And then all of a sudden she went away, you know, went on doing her, her business, what she was doing, looking around for food and other things. But I, if I didn't wait and I was overly excited and I was just taking pictures and I was checking my memory card and doing all these things, I wasn't prepared. So anticipate the moment you want to get, which means sometimes you will miss other moments, but I find that you have a higher propensity to come away with that exact shot that you're hopefully trying to envision. And the same thing could be said for silverback gorillas, this picture of a female silverback gorilla, the same type of thing happened um, out there in the Bewindi impenetrable forest in Uganda, where I'd made eye contact with this uh, female. And uh, she's actually looking over her shoulder. It's kind of hard to tell because I was so zoomed in, but I was sitting there trying to take a picture of her chewing on um, uh, uh, this, this, uh, this plant. And all of a sudden I felt a pull on my left leg and I looked down and another female had walked by me and there was a little little baby on top of her back that had pulled on my pant leg. And so I turned and looked at the ranger I was with because I'm always there with the right personnel and saying, what do you want me to do? And I said, don't move. And once they leave, you can get out of the way. So as I turned, I was waiting for this one moment for this female to kind of turn around and give me the shot that I want. I took one photo, got the exact shot that I wanted because I was patient and I had my gears ready, I had my settings ready. And I just waited for that right moment. Sometimes it doesn't happen and it doesn't come, but you have to be prepared. So be silent when possible. We're almost getting there to our, our autofocus question, uh, Dave, don't worry. 
um, that, that's, that's watching. So be silent when possible. This is super important these days. And I think, again, something that was overlooked until we'd had truly silent cameras, starting with the A9. The reality is, is that when you're out there photographing wildlife, any sounds that you make can be distracting. It can cause species to run away, to be scared, to not pay attention, or to just essentially cause you to miss the shot. And so these images all taken in Costa Rica are just great examples of being close to animals and, and species and not having to have the loud shutter mechanism just rallying off and feeling like almost like a machine gun that is being firing next to you. I, I can't tell you how deafening it sounds as a photographer that has been shooting mirrorless for the last seven years and being able to take advantage of, of silent shooting for the last four or five to be able to send next to a group of photographers that have digital SLRs and just the sounds that they make and how distracting it can be for these species. The first time I used the silent uh, mode of this original A1, <clears throat> I was actually in South Africa with a guy that I'd known for years. And he took me around one morning, the first morning actually, and we had spent time with some cheetahs and some uh, lions and warthogs um, and some wild dogs. And after like two or three hours, I remember him looking back at me and being like, dude, are you going to take any photos? I was like, man, I've been taking them the entire time. I've about like six, 700 I've taken so far. And he just wasn't used to that idea that it can be true silence as you're capturing these images. So if you have that capability within your camera or you're wanting to get into wildlife photography, make sure that silent shooting is a part of whatever camera setup you're going to go with. It is super important. So best settings for birds in flight. This is something that I wanted to, again, address, uh, address and, and Dave had brought up a, a good question. You know, what type of camera settings do we use? These are, again, going to be uh, related to Sony, but some of them can be transferable to other camera manufacturers. So favorite settings for birds in flight. First off, I'm going to course shoot in continuous mode. So this just means that my autofocus system is going to constantly be tracking to try to figure out exactly what I want to photograph. So the next thing is autofocus mode. So this is the type of like area mode that you're trying to use. So for me, it depends on the type of bird I'm trying to capture. If it's a large bird, like a bald eagle, I will usually use either wide or zone. Zone just gives me a little, a smaller block radius that I can position anywhere I want to within my frame, but it still gives me the second largest opportunity in order to um, actually track that specific subject. So for the most part, if it's a big bird, I'm going to use wide uh, or possibly zone. If it's a smaller bird, I'm either going to be using zone or one of the smaller tracking options like expandable spot. Those are all great options. Um, again, this you can relate this to any type of wildlife photography that's in motion. The larger the animal, the, the more amount of autofocus area you want to have so that you can take advantage of things like eye autofocus because uh, otherwise you're going to have a trouble tracking your subjects. I, autofocus tracking sensitivity. This is really important. By default, this is left on, on three. You have a rating of one to five. So what this means is how sticky you want the autofocus to be on a subject once you've locked on focus. Uh, for me, my happy place is usually anywhere between one to three, again, depending on the speed and the size of the creature I'm trying to capture uh, or to photograph. Uh, three, if you don't know what you, you know, if you're not, you're confused about these settings, leave it on three is like, again, that's default. But oftentimes I will leave it as locked on if it's like a bird that's perched that I want to get it capture, uh, get it taking off. Um, sometimes I will use the locked on feature as a one if I know that I'm going to be photographing something that is going to fly by other distracting contrasted elements, such as other birds. Um, if it's in a, a group or a flock of birds that might take off at the same time, locked on can make a big difference between it's staying. Oh, oh my goodness. You know, I didn't turn off my volume. Someone was calling on Skype. Um, anyway, coming back to it. So one to three, depending on the size of the bird, those are my happy places. Um, animal eye autofocus. Again, this is something with birds that's specific to the A1 with the Sony system. Otherwise you do have uh, animal IIF, which is mostly towards mammals. Sometimes it can work with reptiles. And then you have obviously humans uh, for uh, the other mammals that are out there that people like doing studio work. Drive mode, this is going to be exactly how fast your, your, your shutter speed, uh, or not your shutter speed, sorry, your frames per second. So uh, on the A1, you have high plus, which is going to be 30, or you have high, medium, low. Um, on any of the Sony bodies, you can pick those and just know that high or high plus is going to be the maximum frames per second uh, that you can potentially shoot um, compared to, obviously, the lower ones. If you're photographing things that are static, like birds that are, that are perched and not moving, 
then you don't need to use high floss and have 30 frames per second of a bird just sitting there. Um, but that's up to you and your discretion of how many images you want to capture and how many memory cards you have. Uh, steady shot, use the correct mode. Uh, there are three different modes on uh, Sony's um, autofocus or, or steady shot options on the tele super telephoto lenses. You have one, two, and three. Uh, one is kind of your, your standard. Uh, this is going to be for you know animals that are kind of coming at you normally. Number two is generally used for more horizontal movement. So left to right, right to left. And then three is generally used for erratic behavior, uh, birds in flight or small ones that kind of erratically move around. So picking the right steady shot mode will help you stabilize your camera better to be able to come away with uh, sharp images. And then I shoot in manual mode. Some people prefer to shoot um, in shutter speed or aperture priority. It's up to you depending on how comfortable you are with your camera. I prefer manual mode because I'm faster changing that to make sure I'm getting the exact exposure that I want to get. But I absolutely know that other wildlife photographers will say that aperture priority or shutter speed priority mixed in with something like auto ISO with a minimum shutter speed will be advantageous for their style. So for me, it's manual because I'm much more comfortable with those types of, uh, with, with using that mode uh, over the years. And then shutter speed, again, for anything that's in flight at a minimum one five hundredth of a second. Again, that's just a general guideline. Sometimes I'll drop down to one uh, one thousandths if I want to make sure that I'm using a ISO that's not too high. But regardless, um, that's kind of generally my starting point, and it's going to climb higher depending on the speed of the, the species that I'm wanting to photograph. And then ISO, or ISO, I usually start with most wildlife scenes at 400 unless the light is just impeccable and I want to drop it down to 100. But 400 gives me a good starting point to quickly jump around with my shutter speed and still get images that are bright enough depending on the time of day that I'm photographing. And then as I mentioned before, aperture is kind of the variable that I care least about. I don't mean to say that it's not important because it can make a difference between, say, a bird's face and the tip of their, their wings also being in focus. But it's something that I usually think about last sometimes, or a lot of the time I'm shooting at the minimum aperture, sometimes maybe just one stop above it to make sure that that's a little bit of a sharper spot for most particular lenses. But it's something that, like I said, I'm paying more attention to shutter speed and ISO before my aperture. Um, and that allows me to come away with, you know, great images with birds in flight that are super fast, like Quetzals to pretty much anything else out there. Um, it's, it's, it's a good guideline to have as a base point or a starting point to think about with your own photography. Um, very end, tail end here, because I know we have a bunch of questions. So power of clear image zoom. This is a, just a, something I'd like to mention here because most people don't know what it is. Clear image zoom is essentially the ability inside your camera to give you the possibility to zoom two times into your frame without jumping into APS-C mode. So you're still gonna have a full resolution version of your image. The trade-off is that the output is actually a JPEG and not a RAW. So that's kind of a no-go for a lot of people, but there are times where I want to zoom into a shot. I don't have my teleconverters, or sometimes I wanna use that with my teleconverters, and I can all of a sudden be shooting instead of at you know 800 millimeters with my 400 F2.8 and a two times teleconverter, I could shoot at 1600 millimeters with the scene that has a good enough light so that I know I don't need to do a lot of raw processing on it. Um, it's really great for certain types of situations that, again, a lot of people just don't know what it is, but it, you can't engage it on your camera unless you're in a JPEG mode. So like I said, that is the trade-off. But the nice thing about the A1 specifically with clear image zoom is that for the first time, you can actually still use continuous autofocus because before you were actually forced to go into single uh, shot autofocus mode. So with continuous autofocus mode, you can still use the clear image zoom and come away with some pretty incredible images with the right light in the right situations. Um, and so, yeah, that's the, the kind of final little piece. Um, before we go into the questions, you guys are obviously more than welcome to follow me on Instagram uh, at Colby Brown Photography. Um, I also have tons of wildlife photography workshops all over the world. If you guys are interested for 2022, 2023 and beyond, you can find all of that stuff at colbybrownphotography.com. Uh, and obviously, if you have any questions about those, please feel free and reach out. Uh, and yeah, that is it. So I know we have lots of questions, so I will stop sharing here. And there we go. Okay. Hey, that was awesome. Thanks, Colby. Your photography is stunning. Oh, I understand. <laughs> um, yeah, pretty, pretty amazing. We got a ton of questions and uh, 
just going to start off with something that uh, came up early on. This was a, a shared question from Dave and Tom, okay. and it's how do you find guides when you go to different locations? And then Tom asked what criteria do you use to find and select a guide? Yeah, that's a great question. So having the right guide, naturalist, sometimes translator, depending on the country, is hugely important and very valuable. So uh, I usually do this in a step-by-step -step process. The first is I reach out to other people I know that have traveled to these places. I've worked for National Geographic before, so that's usually my first go-to. You know, hey, you know, Bob, uh, Bob Christ, like where have you, uh, or Chris, where have you um, been before? And, and do you know a guide in Madagascar, for example? So that's step one. Obviously, again, not everyone has that opportunity. But Bob if you, knows a guy. Yeah, if, if you know, <laughs> if, if, you, if you don't know someone at Nat Geo, you know, on yeah. message forms, right? On, on uh, the largest Facebook group for the Sony A1, for example, I have people constantly asking questions and sometimes people will go on trips and then someone else will say, hey, who did you use for that? Like that can be a great word of mouth to understand or try to work with someone that you've never met before. If you can't find any of that information, using things like TripAdvisor can be advantageous with some asterisks because like Amazon reviews, some of those can be faked. But for the most part, if I'm going to a location where I can't find a contact to be a fixer on the ground, I will sometimes use something like uh, TripAdvisor to go in to look at the message forms to see who recommended or who has which tour company has a lot of reviews. I will then reach out to them individually, see if they're established, see if I can find them on other places besides TripAdvisor, um, and then start the process from there. If it's someone that I haven't worked with before, I will never send all the money up front for a given expedition. I always send a small portion and the rest of them I will bring with me uh, or I'll pay once I get on the ground. Uh, but these are all just fail safes to make sure that you obviously don't get scammed out there. But That's for the good. most part, it is yeah, definitely TripAdvisor or word of mouth is gonna be your best bet. Yeah, good advice, especially the word of mouth. Yeah, that's, uh, so quick question, you're jumping on the plane. This is from uh, Tom. Yep. How do you carry your gear on the plane? What, what type of bag do you use? Good question. Depends on the gear, depends on the trip and depends on the regulations. Um, I try to use, for the most part, I try to use camera bags that have removable inserts. And what I mean by that, like right now, my main go-to is uh, by a company called Shimoda, Shimoda Designs. And what they do is they allow me to essentially have a backpack shell and then I can pick and choose the size of the internal camera unit, the little, the, the removable shell, the, the removable camera piece inside that if I get to a location, they're like, hey, your bag's too big or it weighs too much or whatever it is. It just won't fit in the overhead, you know, uh, compartment. I say, sure. So I get the check tag at the gate. I put it on the thing. And then as soon as I get to the gate, I open up my camera bag, slide out the insert, walk with it on, which is going to fit on any overhead carrier, which I've been on small charter planes in Papua New Guinea, all the way to you know, random places in Africa to Brazil and the, you know, jungles down there in, uh, in the Amazon. Um, it almost always gets me through. Um, I, I usually always use a roller system sometimes with my heavier gear in transit, but even my rollers will also have those camera inserts. And then I will pack a shell backpack in my duffel bag or carry on or uh, check luggage so that once I get to a location, I can stop using the roller and then literally just pull out the camera unit and slide it in there. Um, sometimes there's certain trips where I have to have a lot of camera gear. I do have to make different sacrifices. Uh, sometimes when I bring in like my 400 and my 600 with some A1s, I've been testing out some other bags because Shimoda has some options, but not a ton of options, uh, for that, which is my bag of preference. So like I have one right here by my feet, which I can't really show you because it's full of gear right now. Uh, it's called Gura gear where I can actually fit two of those super telephoto bent lenses in there. A long-winded answer to your question so we don't take up more time. If you have questions about this that we you know, want more detail, just shoot me a message either on Instagram or through Colby Brown Photography, and I'll try to follow up with either links or other things that I've used uh, and try to help you guys out. Okay, thanks, Colby. Let's uh, keep up with this uh, gear question and go, sure. what tripod do you use from Scott? Scott's asking what tripod is your, I should say tripods. I'm sure you're not a, you're not a mono tripod man. Definitely multiple tripods. Again, depending on... The kind of trip, how remote I'm going, is it going to be accessible by a car? Am I trekking into backcountry to go find a remote species? Um, those are all play a big role, whether I'm using just a standard ball head uh, based tripod or I'm using a gimbal head to track subjects like birds in flight. Uh, for the most part, I'm using both Benro and Enduro with a wide variety of different, uh, they're actually owned by the same company, but a wide variety of um, uh, different strengths in terms of how much, uh, how st stable they are and how portable and packable they are, how much, how much weight matters in a given trip. Am I doing video work? Like all those things kind of play into a role. 
Uh, if you want specific models, again, just shoot me a message and I'll try to follow up uh, specifically because I don't have them off my head and I don't want to step away from the camera just to, to answer that, but I'll help you guys out. Okay, I've got a question. I, I can't believe they put their name in right, but this is, a, I never saw this name before. Karthik okay. is asking this question and uh, it's also related in with Shona asking a question and also Jonathan, and it all took place around uh, 2.30, these questions came in. So how do you use artificial lighting for big mammals and for faraway subjects? Do you make sure those lights don't impact their behavior or are uncomfortable for them? And then Shona said, is there any concern about flash causing distress in the animals? And then can you talk about the difference between using flash versus non-flash lighting in macro wildlife? So those three questions all come together. Jonathan, Absolutely. Shona, and Karthik. Sounds good. All right, let's start with uh, the macro stuff first, and you can remind me of the other questions if I get uh, off on a mm -hmm. tangent. So with macro, you, there really is almost no, well, there's very few opportunities in macro to be able to use something like Sony's 90 millimeter macro with a one-to-one -one magnification to get as close as you are to the subject and still have enough lighting natively. You can get away with using fill light from any of the, the, the Godox, or Godox or the MC aperture lights that I mentioned to help offset something so it's not a full flash situation, but you almost always are gonna need to have that extra light specifically again because of the shallow depth of field you get with macro photography. When you're zooming in on a one-to-one -one ratio, which is what a macro, proper macro lens does, and you're photographing a subject that's so small to the ground, you are much, everything is much darker. There's not enough light. And when you mix that with the idea that you were shooting at F18, F22, so that all of a frog, for example, a frog's face is in focus or a specific kind of snake, then that's gonna make sure that your aperture, your, your opening is even smaller. So you're gonna be in less light. So I'd say with most macro images, the majority of them, you're gonna need to use some off-camera, uh, preferably off-camera flash. You can do on-camera, but I prefer off-camera, mixed in with a soft box to kind of counterbalance that. How strong you want that light and how natural you want it to look is gonna be up to you as the creative you know, individual. But I think it's very, it's vital. You can use accent natural lighting to help light a scene. Um, as in use it along with fill light, but that's about the best that you're going to get in most situations. Um, come, coming to, oh, go ahead. Do you have a question with that? Well, the, uh, I guess that just leads to the, uh, uh, we're using flash. Have you ever, has it bothered your frogs? Has it bothered some of the subjects? Is that? That's a great question. You know, it depends on the species. And again, doing your research, frogs and snakes and other creatures um, are not as susceptible to the sensitivity of light of what's happening with the flashes and what's going on. Oftentimes, I'm almost never flashing them directly as well. We're using soft boxes. We're moving around the subjects. Um, compared to other species, certain animals, certain mammals, uh, predators, cats, things like that, I tend to personally stay away from using flash in those situations, which kind of answers the other question that was mentioned um, because it can make them more sensitive. I know some amazing wildlife photographers specifically with certain kinds of birds will absolutely use a little bit of flash um, in order to use as fill light. And in those situations, again, you're not that close to these subjects. So you're not, it's not powerful enough to be able to cause them to have issues because you're not going to be able to put a flash next to a bear, for example, a brown bear, like you're just not going to be doing that, or it's going to be like your last photo. Um, and so because that, because it's further away, because um, you're taking precautions, most of the time, uh, I don't see it as being an issue. Um, but like I said, it's going to take, it's going to take your own research, depending on the type of creature you're trying to photograph. Certain species are very prone to lights and other species are not. So doing that due diligence and making sure that of course you aren't harming your animals uh, that you're trying to photograph, making sure that you've paid attention to body language and done your research on habits uh, for these different creatures so that you can tell when they're getting uncomfortable are all vitally important in being a good steward for nature when it comes to being a wildlife photographer. Great advice. Um, Jane, uh, on that same topic, uh, Jane, is there any tips on settings to use for gorillas in the forest? Yeah, so if you're talking about actually going uh, like places like Uganda, or Rwanda, um, oftentimes uh, a lot of people think you need longer lenses than you actually need. Um, you know, legally you're supposed to keep seven meters, which is you know 21-ish feet away from these creatures, but obviously they don't know those regulations, so they will get closer to you at times. I personally use when I go to photograph gorillas in the forest for the most part, I'm using actually a 70 to 200 lens. Um, I'm actually heading there for a workshop in early September. 
And that's what I'm recommending for all my clients. A 70 to 200 lens, because at 2.8, you're getting a lot of light in there. And at 70 to 200, you're covering a really nice range within that 21 feet range, even a little bit further. Um, you know, if it's more chimpanzees or certain small uh, monkeys, which are very different than uh, the apes, then you will need a longer lens for those situations of 100 to 400, 200 to 600, depending on how much light you might get underneath the canopy. Because things like howler monkeys, for example, for the most part, live on the tops of trees in Costa Rica, uh, whereas squirrel monkeys, which are smaller and uh, uh, more of a warmer color than the, the, the black colors of howlers, will come down and get much closer. So again, it's going to depend on the type of species and you know monkeys to apes, to all sorts of things, where you're going to go to be the best advice for you. But hopefully that answers some of your question. That's uh, I wouldn't have thought about the seventy to two hundred, but yeah, why not? You get the the two eight, and it can be it can be fairly dark underneath the canopy of trees, right? Absolutely. Yep. Okay, so speaking of uh, of dark and killing your f stops, do you use the two point zero teleconverter with the four hundred GM? Yes, I've used the one point four and the two times teleconverter with both the four hundred and the six hundred, uh, and both have gotten great results. I think something to take into account, and sometimes a mistake that some photographers make is that when they slap on a teleconverter, they don't properly adjust their shutter speed to account for the drastic increase in your millimeter range that you've zoomed in. So for example, a two times teleconverter on the 400 and you have all your settings dialed in and you're getting sharp images, all of a sudden you're shooting at 800 millimeters, that's gonna change the game a bit in terms of how fast of shutter speed you need to use in order for your subject to be captured still, also for breathing or any sway or movement from your tripod or if you're hand holding. So you need to take those things into account, but I've had great results with the 1.4 and the two times teleconverter in different situations, multiple different times with both that 400 and the 600. Um, sometimes I find the 1.4 or specifically the two times teleconverter, it doesn't work as good for me personally on some of the smaller telephoto bodies compared to those big G Master Primes, uh, or at least you have to be much more specific and really over counterbalancing um, for say using it with a one, 100 to 400 or the 200 to 600. You can still get great results, but you are, your cameras, your, your situation is going to be a little bit more finicky and making sure that shutter speed is really fast enough to capture things compared to the, the big prime expensive lenses that really are the best glass that you can get out there. Hey, John is asking, uh, do you try to shoot wide open aperture? And I just kind of want to rephrase his question a little bit. Sure. What's your, what's your target aperture? Where do you tend to try to, to shoot at? My, again, depending on how dark it is, if it's super dark, obviously I'm gonna go as wide open as possible. If I have some light, I'm usually at a stop or a stop and a half from my maximum. If I can avoid shooting at the extremes on either end of the spectrum for a given lens, you're generally gonna get better results. So, you know, instead of shooting at F2.8, shooting at F4, your image might be a touch sharper, things like that. This is less of an issue with again, these super telephoto primes because the glass is just so impeccable and the design, you know, that's why they're so expensive, right? Um, compared to say like the 200 to 600, the 100 to 400. But I would say that light becomes a priority. So if you're shooting in low light, then shoot wide as possible. If you have the light, then try to shoot just a little bit beyond wide open, just so that you're gonna make sure you get the best resolving possible and the sharpest and cleanest images that you can work with, uh, assuming that you have that light to, um, to work with in a given scene. Okay, now people are wanting to return to lunch and whatnot, but we got a couple more questions. Sure. And uh, uh, this is, a, I think it's an easy question because it's you're dealing with these 50 and 60 megapixel cameras, but can you talk about cropping your photos? Yeah, so cropping your photos is really important. Um, it's something, sorry, my dog's here as well. So that's why I'm patting my animal here. There's Ella. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm, my wife and son are not home, so he wants to go outside. She can wait a few minutes though. Um, but essentially cropping your images, that's one of, again, one of the benefits of shooting with 50 megapixels and cropping in, you know, at the end of the day, technology, again, just like with noise, uh, dealing with noise as well as sharpening images has really improved. So being able to upscale images that you've cropped in significantly can still give you some pretty amazing results. So even if you take a 24 megapixel image, say that's the limit of your camera and you got to crop in and your final result is like a seven or eight megapixel, you can really upscale that to sometimes twice its size, sometimes a bit larger, and still come away with some really nice results, assuming you know what you're doing in the post-processing side of things. So using software like Gigapixel or even upscaling within Photoshop can play a role. But for me, you know, if I have the ability, I want to be able to 
fill that frame as much as possible, which is why I use the teleconverters or use these big lenses and maximize that, that you know, the opportunities within the megapixels for a given scene. But if I have to, I'm absolutely comfortable cropping in and then making sure I, again, have a more impactful image. Sometimes you just don't have that opportunity to either get close enough or you don't have the gear to really fill your frame every time. So crop in in post is what I recommend rather than doing it in the field uh, with shooting in APS-C mode or things like that if you're shooting on a full frame camera, because then you have control over how you want to crop and everything else that goes along with it. But technically there's no difference between the two. Argent asks, do you prefer to apply the adjustments in Photoshop Lightroom first and then take it to Topaz or Topaz first and then Photoshop Lightroom? If we're talking about denoise, then t the, the recommended um, workflow process for them is actually to send the raw file over. So they want the raw file to be able to use their raw processor to have the best access for the types of, of details that they're looking for. So being able to use that in the very, you know, beginning stage is going to be your best bet. So I usually will send the image through denoise, goes into Lightroom where I do all my organization, maybe do some light edits, then send a Photoshop to actually process the image. But the the no, denoising aspect is going to happen first, where sharpening oftentimes will happen last. So that's just a kind of different dichotomies of those two, uh, two approaches. Okay, this is a, a great philosophical question. We're going to take it away from gear for a second here. How do you feel about removing things from the photos uh, that distract from the photo, things like branches, et cetera. And I, I never forget a, uh, a nature photographer, Rod Plank. Uh, he was playing with Photoshop, but he was cloning out uh, bird poop on a rock that a bear was sitting on. And he realized what he was doing and he freaked out. But tell us how you feel about your your post, uh, uh, your cloning. Yeah, cropping. it's a great it's a great question. Absolutely. You know, it depends on obviously the what you're trying to do with the images. Certain competitions and things will require that there's no alterations and whatnot. But for me, I'm creating art and I want to make sure that I am, you know, I, I want the focus to be on the, the subject that I'm trying to capture. And so when that's the case, I don't mind removing branches or things that are distracting. I, again, I'm not doing this as a photojournalist. I'm doing this as a photographer and as a creative and I want you to look at an image of a cheetah and not have, you know, a leaf sticking out its ear, right? Like, and I don't have control over that in the field. So I think everyone's going to draw their own ethical line in the sand of what makes sense for them. But for me, you know, taking macro images of flower and cleaning up the, you know, pollen that is, you know, quite dirty or prevalent in those scenes or, you know, same thing with, you know, a photograph of a, a cheetah or a leopard in the brush in South Africa. Like, I'm gonna, I personally usually go through the time to kind of clean those up and make them look as best as they can. I don't like to alter my wildlife images, like changing skies or doing stuff like that. That's my own personal uh, line in the sand, but I don't mind removing distracting elements. So you're not getting into Photoshop and, and taking the gray sky and putting one of those <laughs> amazing sunsets in there. That's right. You're not gonna see auroras above my, you know, pictures of puppins or something like that. That's just not, not my cup of tea. <laughs> totally understand, that's cool. Okay, we're uh, we're just about out of time and let you know a couple of things. First off, uh, good job, Colby. We had over uh, 510 viewers. Awesome. So congratulations. That's a, that's a record for this optic. Well done. And um, also understand that you're going to be traveling in the Amazon on a, a, a B and h project with, uh, with Sony. Yeah, with that's going to be fun. Yeah, next week I head down there and uh, we got some fun stuff planned for uh, B&H's YouTube channel coming up. So you guys stay tuned in the next month or two. We got some great stuff coming. Awesome. Thank you so much, Colby. Thanks for joining us. And thank you, Sony, for providing amazing artisans to discuss the craft and techniques, uh, which really everything you talked about applies to all the camera companies, not just Sony, but but Sony just had an edge, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. Always good to talk, David. Thanks, Colby. Take care. Have a great weekend. Enjoy the shoot. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Awesome. Perfect. That was great. Thanks, guys. Okay, thank you, Colby. Awesome. Great. Have a great trip. Have some fun shooting. We'll Thanks do, again. Man. We'll talk soon. Cheers. Cheers, man.